thanks for taking part in the Rexon.com General Election 2019 Q&A video. Uh, we'll dive straight in. Are you able to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, any political history and why you have the political leanings that you do? Yeah, I mean, I was brought up in Rose. I'm 51. I don't know if you want to know this, Rob, but I'm 51 years of age. Um, I was brought up in Rose. Mother side of the family from Rose, dad side of the family from Pentry Broughton. Um, went to school in Ponky, in Grango and Ruabon. Then uh, was a student in Bristol University and later on did an MA in Cardiff in linguistics. Um, I worked overseas um, for a couple of years, taught English in Japan, but mainly I worked in the voluntary sector mainly writing funding bids uh, for charities um, and the like. But my, my politics really, I think, comes, comes from my home community. My grandfather, Tide, was very political. He was a coal miner, um, firstly at Havard, then at Bersham, retired um, when I knew him. And I think he was always for, you know, the, the working person, really. And I can always remember uh, my interest, really, in the, the Labour movement. Everybody, of course, talks about the, um, the 1945 post-Second World War Labour government and the NHS and its creation and all of the things that that, and the welfare state and all of the things that that government did. My grandfather, the first thing he told me about it was in 1948, that government, um, when it came to ownership of the coal mines, it meant that the, the colliers, the coal miners, um, had pit head baths, so they were able to uh, come home clean from uh, from the baths. So, for a, I, when I was a little child, I thought that was the most famous thing the the post war Labour government had done. But I think what it made me realise is that actually politics and elected politics can make a difference. And that I think, I mean, my I joined the Labour Party when I was seventeen, um, which was at the height of the um, Thatcher government because I felt it, it was a very unfair and divisive government. And I believe the best traditions of the Labour Party in Wales and more widely across the UK and globally actually is about solidarity. It's about people coming together. And I, I think that's ever, ever more necessary now in a world where I think the big solutions are collective solutions whether it's in terms of the world of work, whether it's in terms of how we deal with prosperity, whether it's in terms of social mobility, or indeed whether it's in terms of dealing with the climate emergency. So that, that, that's really a potted history of uh, my politics, I think. We've been asking other candidates, uh, this is the third election in four years, people are fed up with party politics, politicians, yeah. and feel that you're all the same, they never listen to anyway, et cetera, et cetera, and asking them what's different. Uh, You've obviously been in place for a decade. Um, are those comments targeted to the likes of yourself who've had a parliamentary seat for many years? Well, it's nine and a half years. I mean, one of the, one of the I think it was the Chartists that were advocating annual elections. I wouldn't advocate um, that. But I think one of the things about uh, one of the advantages, the very frequent elections, is that we have to go around very. Um, frequently. I certainly think there is a sense that people are fed up. I think there's, um, there's a sense that people are fed up with a lot of the debates. I mean, you t it's interesting, we were, um, is, is the debates that we have on the doorstep with people. I've had a couple of journalists in this election phone me up and saying, you know, how are people reacting on the whole issues to do with Brexit? And I suspect you'll probably have a question for me on that later. I'll come back to that. But what is interesting, actually, is when you go round on the doorsteps, people are talking about a whole range of things. So yes, I think that there is a fed upness with politics out there, but, it, but people aren't fed up with talking about their own experiences, their own lives and what's going on. And one of the things I'm picking up very, very clearly is that after nearly a decade of austerity and cuts which, are, which have affected people in ordinary working communities like ours a great deal, people have a great deal to say and it's important that those views are reflected. When people are looking at your record, what would you say you've personally achieved for Clued South specifically? I think, I mean, for, for me, the biggest thing is the people that we help. I mean, myself and my staff, we help about 800 to 1,000 local people a year. And it can be something like um, where you have someone with a disability and they have a um, personal, ind um, personal independence payment claim where we've helped overturn bad decisions. And there was a time that the number of those bad decisions was running at 75% uh, plus. It can be due to do with working with local groups. I've been working 
speaking for a while, for instance, with the friends of Ruaban about the state, you know, the station there and getting improvements there. And, and sometimes that comes with frustrations. We thought we had got the disability access, myself, the friends, the local uh, representative in the community. We had the money all there ready to go from a Welsh government and the UK government didn't match it. Now, I think that was a wrong decision, but we keep it going. We're not letting them get away with it. And I mean, for me, it's about getting, it's about working with individuals, working with groups of people around here and trying to get the best we can from government. Aside from Brexit, which we will touch on later, what do you feel is the top issue for Clean South in the forthcoming parliamentary term and briefly explain how you'd like to see your desired outcome achieved? I think the most important thing is that we have proper investment in our community and that we actually think long term. I think we've got to look at serious investment, whether in health, social care, schools and the like, and we've got to have greater fairness because I don't want a world where there are five where there are five thousand people who have to be helped in the Wrexham area by food banks. I think there's got to be uh, greater fairness. But what that means is different in the different communities. It's it's very very different if you're in a farming area. What what where does that how does that fairness actually happen? Well, one way I think it happens is that we ha we actually have to say to Boris Johnson and his uh, local sidekicks and the right of the Tory party around here, it doesn't happen through a hard Brexit. When it, for, for some people, for instance, there's whole issues. Um, I, you know, I signed a campaign uh, pledge yesterday, which was to do with supporting uh, people with terminal illnesses, where the system is very, very unfair. So it's different for different people. But I think the priority is trying to get fairness for everyone. There's been lots of talk in the three years since the referendum about Scotland, Northern Ireland and England in their own right. How will you make the Welsh voice stronger in Parliament? Well, I've always tried to do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm a strong devolutionist. I, always, I don't support independence, but I'm a strong devolutionist and I always have been. And when I was a shadow minister for Wales, we were taking out um, the Wales bill and it, it's um, slightly surreal in a way. But I mean, I, you know, I had the joy of actually uh, speaking as, a, as an MP in Westminster, saying how I thought um, certain powers, extra powers should uh, be devolved to Wales. And we moved to a system of um, the reserve powers model now, which basically means that um, everything goes uh, back to Wales, apart from those areas where we think it's better and fairer, where the power is UK wide. So I, th I think that's important. I think we've also got to look at more devolution for um, different parts of Wales, something my good colleague uh, Ken Skates is very much on the case um, as a minister. But I think we've got to be careful about one thing, and that is we don't, um, what happened, because I think there are certain things that the UK does better, to, uh, better together, unquestionably, and I think that involve, we've got to be very, very careful that we don't let what uh, one former Tory MP in North Wales described as the English nationalists at the helm of the right of the Tory party inadvertently break up the UK because they want to do something extreme in terms of our relations with Europe. What non-Brexit policy commitment are you most proud about standing alongside at this election? There's quite a, there's quite a lot of them. I think scrapping universal credit's important. I think Labour's um, plans on tackling the climate emergency the um, green industrial revolution is important. I think, I'm hoping we're hearing, and we, I'm speaking to you today, the day of the launch of the UK Labour Manifesto. I'm hoping there'll be something in there to help those very, very many women who were born in the 1950s and still didn't have uh, proper pension rights. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just a small selection, but I, I think those will be important, important national ones. Looking on social media, uh, Clue South yourself have used hashtag real change. Can there really be real change if you've been there for so, so long? <laughs> um, but I think it's, <laughs> you say that, but uh, I, keep, I do keep coming back and asking people, you know, and probably more in, I mean, this will be my fourth election in nine and a half years, which is, you know, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, as it goes. So I think, you know, I think the main thing is we, we are actually um, ask, asking people, I didn't put myself there, um, but I think it's, it's also important. I mean, 
yeah, I think I mentioned earlier in this interview, myself and my staff team, we help about 800 to 1,000 local people um, every year. Now, I, we were up in Akravira, as it happens, uh, yesterday. I was talking to a lady there. I, I, I'd never met her in person before, and she said, "You'll definitely." She said, "I'm not that into politics, but you'll definitely be getting my vote because of how, um, what you did to um, help help a member of my family." So I think as long as we're doing that, you know, as long as we're, um, I'm, I'm not just sitting there with my feet up idling away, um, and I'm coming back and asking people, you know, I. I, I I think I can safely say the real change hashtag might work for me. But more importantly, I think we're talking about it working for our communities in the country too. The NHS is obviously a cornerstone talking point or policy yeah, sure. for all parties. Yeah. Obviously in Wales, health is devolved. Yeah. Policy and spending comes from Wales yeah. Labour. Locally, the health board is in special measures, mm -hmm. which is top level intervention really from Welsh sure. government. Yeah. Uh, Welsh government, Welsh Labour. Yeah. Welsh Labour fingerprints you could say is quite all over it. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, <laughs> Do you see what's going on in the local health system as a shining example of what Labour can do for the NHS? I think we've, you know, we, we all know. Well, first of all, I think it, it comes from a system we, we've got to recognise that since 2010, um, the Welsh Government budget has gone down from now, I believe it's over 1.4 billion. So that's going to affect on something. I think we can safely say that in, if you add up health and social care expenditure, it comes to, I think the figure's about £290 per person extra in Wales than it does in England or Scotland. But that doesn't really help if you're stuck in A&E for the best part of a night, as, as for instance, I was with my father um, last spring. And I think we've got, to, we've got to look at all these issues really, really carefully. We can't pretend there aren't problems where there are. There are clear issues with uh, the Health Trust, with Betsy. Sometimes, you know, and I think we have to be putting pressure to make things improve. I think the, the jury is out as to whether one health trust in the form of Betsy is the best way of managing things. I sometimes think the independent trust that runs Betsy gets it wrong as they did totally on the issue of the nurses, rotors and the like, and I'm glad that was changed. But we've certainly got to look at these issues and we've certainly got to accept where things, you know, where things aren't good enough. But what I don't want to do is for us, it's some, and this is where I think people do get fed up with politicians, is where we look at these massive and serious problems and just say, oh, well, your party this, your party that, when we're talking about local hospitals. Because we, what we're talking about is people, not just people, my dad, but people in communities around here. And we've got to look at how we can do this best. And yet, yeah, if you're talking about an over -lo um, a, a long wait in A&E, that's clearly not it, because we've, got to, we've just got to do things better. Because if we don't, we're not serving anybody. A win for you could help Jeremy Corbyn become Prime Minister. Uh, when you resigned as Shadow Wales <laughs> Office Minister, you said... It's this is old news now. Come on, you asked me this one last time. It's abundantly clear that Jeremy Corbyn could never become Prime Minister. It's also clear he does not command any real electoral support outside the M25. Is that still the case? And what are your thoughts on Mr Corbyn's support what? outside the 0483? Well, he got, he got a bit more last time than we thought, didn't he? Um, I think, I mean, am I a Corbynite? No, I've never been one. I've never hidden that. It's not, use, it's not news to you, me or anyone else. But I think this election is actually about some serious stuff. This is about whether we want the most right wing prime minister in the form of Boris Johnson, a little acolyte to Donald Trump in the state. Do we want him to have a majority of MPs in Westminster? Do we want him to be dealing with his extreme free trade deals that will include the NHS and whatever else with Donald Trump? Do we want those things? Somebody who built his entire career before he went into politics on um, writing articles in the Telegraph and the Spectator and the like, talking down anything what he referred to as red tape, what most of us would see as decent protections for workers' rights and the environment. Do we want this man to get a majority? And if we don't, then I think we, we actually have to be real and it's vital, the Labour Party and also the, the broader centre left, because I think there are a lot of things actually that people who not just support Labour or people who are floating voters, but people who support the Lib Dems, the Greens and Plaid have in, com in common. And I think we've got to come together at this election to make sure that man Boris Johnson is never ever allowed a majority in Parliament. 
Touching on, on, on that, we looked, I think it was the Clear South Labour Twitter account that said it is Corbyn or fascism. You don't seem that keen on Corbyn, and obviously you're not keen on the other. I'm not into this personality stuff. I'm isn't, into working for people around here and what, and what Parliament can do. Isn't the message there to people, if, if you're not keen on one or the other, not to vote, essentially? Is it, it's quite a negative message, surely? I, I mean, I don't think it's that extreme a message. I mean, I think what it's actually saying is you're either supporting, you're, you're either in seats like this, supporting the Labour Party in this election, or you're backing somebody whom I've already said I regard as an extreme right winger in the form of Boris Johnson, who is allied to, well, he's already um, a highly dubious creature in the form of uh, Cummings running his office in Downing Street, who is closely aligned to Donald Trump and a whole host of other far-right leaders from around the world. So I, I don't think there's anything that controversial in that particular tweet, personally. Uh, I know you refer to them as being old quotes, but in, at the time you, you were looking to the future um, in 2016. Uh, you said, I want to see the Labour Party's come together for Jeremy Corbyn to show leadership by reaching out widely to the party and to the country. Do you think that's happened? Um, <laughs> I think I think all elections offer offer a chance to that. And I, I mean, I was watching the debate last night, and as I say, I you know I, I am my my background, as in many uh, Labour people from the the Rose area, many Labour people from our areas, is very much on a different wing of the Labour Party. But I, I don't think there was anything that partisan in what he said. And I think a lot of the stuff that he was talking about, trying to bring people together on Brexit, speaking about investment, speaking about the NHS, I, I think that was a form of reaching out. And I think that's important because I think we need everyone to reach out today. We can either play the game. We can either pretend politics is a sort of down market version of the Hello magazines and talk just about personalities, or we can talk about the issues. And I think the reason a lot of people get fed up with politics today is we don't talk about the issues enough. There's been criticism of how your party has handled anti-Semitism. It's mm -hmm. been a topic not just in the short election period. Do you think your party has an issue with that? And if so, has it been tackled pro uh, properly? And what more would you like to see done? I think anti-Semitism, wherever it happens, is a horrible and huge problem. And I think it's a source of great shame wherever that is found um, and you know I, this, clearly there have been examples inside the Labour Party and that is a source of great shame where it's found there. It is also a source of great shame where it is found in other in other elements of society as, as is indeed any other form of racism. I mean I, I, I think the law in this country on anti-Semitism is much much too lax. Um, in I think it's around 15 countries across Europe, Holocaust denial is actually a criminal offence. Now in Germany if you are a Holocaust denial you could be sentenced to jail for up to five years. Um, and I I, 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 meant, I spoke, mentioned this in a speech in Parliament once. I also asked the then Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, why isn't Holocaust denial illegal in this country? And he gave a fairly nuanced answer where he was talking about free speech. And I'm sorry, that to me isn't free speech, it's hate speech. And I think part of the reasons we have this historic problem, with, and, and, and I really mean historic, if you go back to Shakespeare, you've got it in The Merchant of Venice. Part of the reason we've got this historic problem, I think, is the law has never in this country taken it seriously enough, in contrast to the laws in many parts of Europe. Nationalisation of uh, Royal Mail, rail operating companies, energy supply networks, possibly water, sewerage, and, and recently the open reach section of BT for the uh, for broadband have been mooted. Uh, earlier this month the CBI concluded that such nationalisation could cost around about £200 billion, if not more, with the open reach figures added in. What would you like to see nationalised and why? And also, is this nationalised com nationalisation of companies for the benefit of the UK rather than, say, Wales? I, I think we need a much wider debate on ownership, but not just ownership ownership and effectiveness of companies because I think we can honestly say sometimes if something's run by the state it's not very efficient but equally I think we can sometimes say if things are run by the private sector that may be that may well be the case um, too 
I think, I mean, I am confident that my party will be looking at this in a very, very practical way. Let me give you an example um, with, um, the, with Virgin Trains and the West Coast Mainline for anyone, you know, is you'd be looking at, we'd be looking at this from when it came to the end of its franchise. And I think the thing, if we feel that something is better publicly owned, we would be looking at that at a very pragmatic and sensible time because, you know, our priority in terms of expenditure clearly is public services. So it's it's not the idea that we just have some sort of ideological fanaticism with buying, buying up private industries. That's not true. And when we look at ownership of industries, I think we've got to look at we're not we you know we're not talking about some 1950s, 60s, 70s style nationalisation. We're looking about how can ownership be better for um, for the um, for the consumers and the employees it's a very very different way and i think you know that's we, we've got to have a wider debate on it so that we can both serve the people who use those services and the people who work for them at the end of the election a coalition is a possible outcome and obviously all candidates will say they're focused on the outright win etc etc but putting that aside to force a direct answer what would be your most comfortable coalition <laughs> Um, it's a sort of, yeah, it's a sort of which relatives would you like to see best for Christmas question really, isn't it? Um, it's, I don't, I, I don't think it's, I don't, I really don't think it's up for, it's, it's up to us to decide the outcome of this election. Every party rightly goes in. Um, certainly the main parties rightly go into this wanting a majority you know that would be very strange if we didn't however you know we equally at the end of it people people have to have to consider what happens um, next so I don't think that I think that is so this is why I think sometimes people are fed up of political parties is where they try and do these little sort of deals beforehand let's see what the electorate give to us but I think every every serious political party will be looking at getting a majority how did you vote in the referendum do you know that <laughs> I voted remain and I would if it was tomorrow as well was that remain or remain with changes to the EU? Well, I think, you know, the EU needs modifications, as I think most institutions do. But I think the deal we have at the moment is the, uh, is the best one we're going to get. But having said that, in Parliament, of course, um, because I'm representing an area, I voted for some things that wouldn't have been my personal preference. I, I voted, as I promised people I would, so I did. I voted to trigger Article 50. I have also voted for a customs union, even though I believe that the deal we've got now it would be better than a customs union. You know, so I, I've been prepared to make those comprom compromises as an MP. Uh, in May, there was the EU election and your leaflets include, so I said this is the election to give people the chance to send a message to UK government. The Brexit party got 12,000 votes, uh, Labour uh, applied, Lib Dems got around about four and a half, five thousand. What message do you think that did send to the UK government and what message did it send to you? I think what message it sent to the uh, UK government, myself and everyone else, is this country, we're in a heck of a mess over Brexit and we are very, very divided. And that's why I think on this issue, um, my party support getting, uh, you know, trying to get a, a better and fairer deal because we, we, we've got no truck with what Boris Johnson is offering, which I believe would break up the UK and would essentially, in terms of trade terms, be a no-deal Brexit anyway, would be to try and get a better deal, closely aligned to single market and customs union membership. And then we offer that back to the people. And it's not going to be pleasant because I think whatever comes out of this, we've got a deeply, deeply divided country. Touching on that, you pre uh, previously Labour have said they're going to deliver Brexit. The policy they say is to offer a vote, and it says this time the choice will be between leaving with a sensible deal or remaining in the European Union. Yeah. And Labour will then carry out whatever the people decide. Mm -hmm. Surely the people did decide in a what was branded a once in generation vote, and then you're asking them again even after a general election that you know, it was apparently about Brexit as well. Surely this is almost double doubly undemocratic. Is it though? I mean, let's forget about me. I've already told you I voted Remain. I've always been quite honest about that. But just think about Boris Johnson. Theresa May went to negotiate her deal. She brings it back to Parliament. 
Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg and a whole host of other Tories who will leave us saying, no, no, you might have done a deal, we don't agree with this, we're voting against it. She brings it back another time. They do exactly the same thing. On the third time of asking, I think Boris Johnson decides he wants to be Tory leader and thinks he better vote for it. Re Jacob Rees-Mogg, a whole host of other Tories like Owen Paterson and the like, they vote against it. So, and now we have a situation with Boris Johnson that their old allies in the DUP won't support it because they see it as dangerous for the UK. So I don't think, I don't think, even if you look at the, on the Leavers, uh, the people who'd always back Leave, they can't seem to agree. How on earth can you expect those of us who are among the 48% to agree with it either? Uh, your party leader will not say whether he'll campaign to leave or remain in a second referendum or when the vote comes back. The UK party leader? Yes. Uh, is this not an attempt to appeal to the masses without actually making a commitment? And do you think it's important that people know what the leaders think? I think, I mean... Our, our manifesto commitment is, is absolutely clear. We're going to try and negotiate a better deal, then we're putting it back to the people. If the, uh, you know, if the Labour person who was the designated candidate for PM thinks it's better to be neutral in that, I don't think that matters. What we will see is a huge number of, I mean, in Wales, Welsh Labour will be totally, Welsh Labour government will be, um, will be backing Remain. But I think, I think that's a genuine attempt um, I think that's a genuine attempt to try and bring the country together and we need it. How would you campaign for Remain in that situation? I've always said that I believe there is no deal better than the one we get now. And I've also said something else, Rob, because when I've spoken to farmers in our area where 90% of their exports are with the EU, I was talking, I had a meeting with the Farmers Union of Wales about a month ago, I think it was, um, where we were up, up in the Corwin area talking about this and they were saying, well, look, you know, if we don't have at very least a customs union, a very least single market, preferably putting this back to the people, we're going to be bust. We're going to go out of business. Talk to people around here that work to air Airbus and the like. Now, I could sit here, I could be the archetypal politician and say, I won't make a stand on this, but I will make a stand because if I lose my job in this election because of what I believe is a totally honest and principled stance that I have taken, having also incidentally made some compromises by voting to trigger Article 50 and voting for a customs union, if I don't make a stand on this, yes, it does mean I could lose my job, but I, could, I can actually hold my head up high on that as a matter of principle. What I can't hold it up high is if I tell a pile of rubbish to people and it means that hundreds and thousands of other people in North Wales and in this constituency end up losing their jobs because their uh, Welsh Labour candidate and MP is basically lied to them. I won't do it. Have you got anything else to add for potential voters watching this? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I've been very, very honoured to represent my home constituency of Cloyd South for the last nine and a half years. I would be deeply honoured if that trust were, were uh, restored again and that I was re-elected in this seat. And I think it's vital again. I think the Tories, they've always tried to divide us nationally and locally. And I would ask uh, I would be most grateful for the votes of local residents, including in some cases their tactical votes, to ensure that we don't elect one of Boris Johnson's flock in this seat. And I would also, on a personal level, be deeply honoured for their support. Thank you very much. Hopefully see you in the debates early December. You certainly will. Thank you very much, Rob.